Hi there. One of the topics in growth and development that's particularly interesting at the moment is the idea of the middle income trap. So let's spend a few minutes thinking about it. If you look at this chart, this chart shows GDP per capita in, uh, in US dollars, PPP adjusted on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, the 10-year average annual growth rates for a selection of countries. Now, as you can see over time, as countries get richer, they slow down. The rate of growth of real GDP um, falls, falls away. The key question is whether countries can reach a high level of income, a high level of per capita income, before their growth rate slows down sufficiently that per capita incomes stop rising. Now, countries such as Korea, Taiwan, Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan have all managed to escape the middle income trap, despite a slowdown in their growth rates. One of the key questions at the moment is whether China will be able to move from middle income to high income before its economy slows down considerably. Here's the economist Linda Yu on the middle income trap. After three decades of rapid growth, that's growth of nearly 10% per year, China is now approaching the so-called middle income trap. Uh, worth noting at this point that some economists argue this trap does not exist. A middle income trap is a dramatic slowing of an economy after it's reached upper middle income status, which is around thirteen dollars to $14,000 per year per capita, PPP adjusted. According to this article from Linda Yu, history is littered with examples of countries such as Argentina, uh, where countries where growth slows so much that they never join the ranks of rich nations. The OECD estimates that only a dozen or so countries, including South Korea, and uh, Greece, Spain and Italy have escaped this trap in the post-war period. So there is something called the middle income trap. Some economists think it doesn't necessarily exist. Others think it's a relevant concept. So what might cause the middle income trap? The idea basically is that as countries reach a certain level of per capita income, the growth rate that got them to middle upper middle income level is sl slows down and the growth that got them there is not the same growth that can get them from upper middle income to high income. The risk is that countries enter a phase, oftentimes a long period of time, of stagnant real per capita income growth. So what might be causing this? Often it's the labour market, that countries have relied heavily on rapid growth of labour intensive light manufacturing, for example, China is a good example, and big migrations of workers from rural to urban areas. And over time, the labour supply and the demographics just become less favourable. The surplus supply of labour coming from rural to urban areas dries up and the so-called Lewis turning point is reached. The Lewis turning point, which is where as the labour supply becomes more scarce, wage inflation accelerates and strips away some of the labour cost advantage that these countries have. So the middle income trap might be the result of the erosion of comparative advantage from fast growing low cost labour supply. A second cause is that the rate of growth of productivity or labour efficiency tends to slow down. Oftentimes countries see diminishing returns to extra capital investment. The increased productivity from the rapid rise of manufacturing tends to, to ebb away. And productivity can slow down particularly if countries don't invest sufficiently in human capital, especially in secondary and tertiary education. And in some countries, the pace of innovation slows down and that can hold back productivity. The middle income trap might also be the result of institutional failures. Perhaps the quality of government is not necessarily sufficiently good to maintain the rate of growth. Corruption can be a key barrier to growth and development. Financial systems may be underdeveloped and not able to cope with high levels of saving and credit demand. And many countries that grow rapidly get to upper middle income levels, upper middle income levels, they end up uh, with inflationary booms or credit bubbles, which eventually burst as speculative investments have their effect. So the middle income trap is something that's relevant to lots and lots of countries. This uh, nice graphic uh, comes from BBAV Research, a Spanish company, and looks at low, middle income and high income countries. So let's take, for example, a low income country such as Bangladesh or Vietnam. The key drivers of growth there are favorable demographics, rapid, rapid urbanization, uh, strong returns to capital. They're on the uh, upward sloping part of the solar curve and uh, ability to exploit a comparative advantage in manufacturing using lab low, low labor cost, labor intensive businesses. However, there's big risks, particularly institutional and uh, institutional failures, social unrest, continued extreme poverty and rising inequality. 
middle-income countries tend to have different drivers of growth. They're moving more towards the tertiary sector. They're trying to diversify their manufacturing sector and make more sophisticated, higher-value goods. They have an emerging middle class of consumers who want to demand more goods and services. And hopefully they experience financial deepening, financial services such as insurance and credit, equities and bonds available to more consumers and more businesses. But equally, as we've seen in the middle income trap, uh, wages tend to rise, higher education may be underdeveloped, and the country may not necessarily have the high level technological skills and the infrastructure to keep those countries growing. According to this graphic, countries such as China, Thailand and Malaysia all fall into that bracket. Now, we're not going to say too much about high income countries in this uh, in this presentation because our focus is on the middle income trap. But high income countries tend to be highly diversified. They have lots of economic complexity and capability. They have sophisticated industries capable of making many different products. And they have a well established and uh, quite significant welfare system. They face though different risks, in particular an aging population, uh, high levels of fiscal budget deficits and fiscal debt particularly the high levels of inequality of income and wealth, and their credit systems may become over leveraged. So there are clearly problems for all types of countries at all levels of income. Now, China has undoubtedly grown very quickly. China does have economic cycles, as we can see here. But even, at the, even when an economy grows by only 6 or 7% per year, uh, because of China's size now, that's a significant increase in real GDP. For example, in 2016, if China grows by 6.5%, it will add to the world economy a country the size of the Netherlands. If it grows by just over 6%, it will add in one year to the world economy a country the size of Turkey. So China is still growing rapidly, but China remains a relatively poor country. This chart shows Chinese GDP per head relative to the United States, and China is in the deep orange colour. They've made significant progress. Since 1992, China's per capita incomes relative to the USA have risen from just 5% to nearly 30%. But you can see that despite this, of over nearly 20 years of rapid growth, China remains extremely poor relatively to the United States. Well, China is aware of the middle income trap. And of course, their latest five year plan is trying to fast forward a process, process of structural economic reform designed to make China a moderately well-off society by 2020. In other words, take China closer from being an upper middle income country to being a higher income country. And there are five key elements of their 13th five year plan. Innovation, regional development, green development, in other words, renewable sustainable development, the opening up of Chinese markets within the world economy, and inclusivity, in particular, trying to lift the incomes of the poorest 40%. So China is aware of the issues. What kind of strategies can countries that might conceivably be facing the middle income trap uh, implement to try and lift their economies, sustain their growth rates, and raise per capita incomes close to the high income OECD level? Well, there's lots of different possibilities here. I've provided with you with 12. Uh, sometimes growth is sustained by having a sufficiently large middle class whose incomes are going up because that creates a demand for goods and services and oftentimes encourages economies of scale in manufacturing production. Foreign direct investment, FDI, can be a significant boost to an economy, particularly if it increases the capabilities and capacities of the economy. So, for example, manufacturing FDI into countries such as Ethiopia and Zambia. Investment in human capital is absolutely vital. Not just to lift labour productivity, which is clearly important, but also to sustain a higher level of, of per capita incomes in the long term. Because better human capital promotes more innovation. Improved working conditions and basic welfare safety nets can also help. It allows people perhaps to save a little less of their income and uh, invest more in education and health. Investment in hard infrastructure, uh, such as ports and airports and high-speed rail, for example, is important. And so too in soft infrastructure, including institutions. Many middle-income countries might think about opening up their economies to more competition as a way to try and increase allocative, productive and dynamic efficiency. And a good example, countries that are a good example of doing that include Singapore in the past. To escape the middle-income trap, you need really good macro policies. You need effective central banks to control inflation and you need governments that are able to generate enough tax revenue and keep their spending under control to maintain fiscal stability. A large number of middle income countries in the world have recently signed up to free trade agreements 
and regional trade agreements, including ASEAN, in order to boost trade, trade creation and capital investment. And another way out of the middle income trap is to develop your, your research and development industries. That, of course, requires sufficient investment in higher education. The middle income trap can be avoided if you have a broad base of diversified industries which have linkages. In other words, countries have capability and diversity because this makes your country less vulnerable to external economic shocks. And crucially, to, be, to escape the middle income trap, you need to have a sufficiently large and sufficiently robust private sector to stimulate product and process innovation and drive efficiency gains. But fundamentally, of course, to escape the middle income trap, you need to raise all boats. You need to lift per capita incomes so that the size of the market grows each year. And interventions to tackle deep, persistent income and wealth inequality can also have a significant role to play. So there's much that countries can do to help avoid the middle income trap. This is quite interesting in terms of uh, some Asian economies and their preparedness for the future. Uh, it's, it comes from a business called the Conference Board. And it suggests that there are a number of countries which are actually quite well prepared in terms of lifting their uh, human capital in the years to come to lift their incomes above upper middle towards higher income levels. And the Conference Board pick out Thailand and the Philippines and to a lesser extent Malaysia as countries that have done that. And, uh, but countries at the bottom, Pakistan, Myanmar, formerly Burma, are much less well placed in terms of preparedness and getting ready for the future in terms of skill preparedness, human capital. There are many other barriers to growth and development which we haven't talked about. Vulnerable employment, exploitation of workers, uh, persistent embedded gender inequality and other forms of discrimination. Barriers to growth from trade barriers such as imports and import quotas and tariffs. The traps of being a landlocked country are important too. The threat of inflation for some countries, deflation for others, and wealth, in, and wealth and income inequality. The middle income trap is an idea which suggests that growth rates slow down beyond a certain income point. And at various points in time, a country at different stages of development will probably experience one or all of these issues. But all of them have to be tackled in some way to drive the economy forward. So this has been a brief presentation on the middle income trap. Now, some economists argue that this does not exist. But I think if you look at a number of relatively high middle income countries whose growth rates have slowed down and their relative position has stagnated in recent times, I think of countries such as Malaysia and perhaps countries such as Russia, you can make a case for saying the middle income trap does exist. China, for one, is uh, ramping up their structural reforms to try and help ensure that they don't fall into the middle income trap.